Tea with a Demon, a Cursed Candy Story, written by Kate Lawley, narrated by Jennifer March. Part One All Things Magical and Bumpy Things in the Night Once upon a time, not so very long ago, there was a woman with a great aunt and a great aunt with a book. It was time to pitch my idea to my great aunt. She'd made this cool thing, and it was just kind of sitting there, underutilized, gathering dust, not quite ignored, but almost. Since I was feeling a little on the underutilized side myself right now, it seemed like the perfect project. Work wasn't challenging me, and I'd stashed a little nest egg, enough that I could quit, take a break for a personal project, and then look for another gig. But I wasn't quitting my job unless I could sell her on the idea. I could, and I would, because it was a great idea. I picked up my phone and made the call. Hey, Aunt Griselda. Trixie, my favorite niece. Lovely to hear from you. Total fib. Her favorite niece was my sister, Tish. I didn't hold it against her. Tish would be my favorite niece, too. Tish was the perfect witch, with the perfect job and the perfect husband, and yet she wasn't too perfect as a person. Everyone adored Tish. After a few preliminaries, were her cholesterol numbers improving? Was she back to gardening yet? Was she making her daily walk? I said, I was reading Magical and Bumpy last night. Oh? The curiosity in her voice was 100% manufactured. My great aunt, affectionately known as Aunt Griselda by Tish and me, Grizzy to her contemporaries, had a touch of the sight. Every witch family has its magical strengths, and a strong sense of intuition ran in mine. But Aunt Griselda's magic was more than run-of-the-mill intuition. She had the supercharged variety that came with visions— what I wouldn't give for the occasional peek into the future, however opaque. Maybe I'd have avoided my last three disastrous romantic entanglements. You knew perfectly well I was calling, didn't you? And why? Might have, yes. A touch of humor colored her voice. Go on, then. Ask. I'd like to put Magical and Bumpy online. Like an e-book? So, she didn't know all the details. Also, how cool was it that my 79-year-old great-aunt knew about e-books? I can do that if you'd like, but I was thinking more along the lines of a website, a wiki, if you're familiar with the term. Hmm, if that's a fancy word for an encyclopedia when it lives on the Internet, then yes. I could hear the tap of her nail on her kitchen table as she considered my proposal. We could create a paywall so only subscribers can have access, if you want to generate income. But I thought, no, if we do this, we make it free. I smiled. That was exactly what I was hoping she would say. Witches didn't have special schools. We didn't have universities of magic. We had family mentors who passed along knowledge to the younger generations. It worked relatively well, so long as a witch's magic was spotted in a timely fashion and there was a suitable family mentor to provide training. And it worked best when a witch's magic ran true to their bloodline. My family had a knack for potions and intuition magic. We also had a lot of magic in our family, meaning almost everyone in the family was a witch. With such magical abundance, it was unlikely that magical inclinations in our youngsters would go unspotted. On the other hand, poor cousin Seth. He felt like he didn't fit in with the rest of us. And that was true. He was the only family member in my generation who wasn't a witch. As for fitting in, my sister Tish had married a brewmaster. What was beer other than a potion without magic? Well, mostly without magic. And intuitive witches were drawn to the service industry, 
So her job running the tasting room for her husband's family brewery was a perfect fit. Tish was the perfect loony. Except she was married, so now she was the perfect smith. On the day of her wedding, I told her I was more envious of her name change than her charming husband. She thought I was joking. While I'd inherited the family intuition, I hadn't gotten a jot of the loony potion skill. Though I could make a mean cup of coffee, it seemed coffee, unlike beer, wasn't a potion by another name. Coffee was its own fantastic and wonderful thing. Coffee making and creature spotting, or creature tracking to be more accurate, those were my unique aptitudes. That second one I'd only recently discovered, and it certainly didn't run in my family. You still there, Pumpkin? I rolled my eyes. My hair was not orange. I was a redhead, not an orange head. I didn't love that nickname. But I loved Aunt Griselda dearly. Yep, still here. And I'm thrilled you'd consider a free option. I think a lot of people could benefit from the knowledge in Magic and Bumpy if it was made available online. But... Of course, she could sense my hesitation. Um... It's about your sources. She laughed. What about them? They were the best I could manage. But she knew what I meant. She'd interviewed other family mentors. They were the most knowledgeable witches and studied what books there were. She worked to parse myth from fact and done a good job. That was why all things magical and bumpy things in the night, even with its comical title, had intrigued me for so long. Initially, I'd appreciated the topic and the range of information, and then, when I'd stumbled upon my own special brand of magic, the insight it had given me into my unique magical capability. We can do better. Oh? And now there was more than curiosity in my great aunt's voice. Now there was excitement. Have you ever met a dragon, Aunt Griselda? Or a demon? Or come close to those small furry things that live in trees and pretend to be squirrels but are really related to fairies? No dragons, no demons, and no furry fairies. Not up close. Are you suggesting we venture forth and try to find some of these creatures? There was the excitement again. I'm saying, I know how we can meet some magical things and maybe some bumpy things in the night. How? How would we find them? I'm almost eighty and never met a demon once. About that, there's something I haven't told you about my magic. And thus began the adventures of Trixie and Griselda as they tracked and catalogued magical things and also, whenever possible, bumpy things in the night. Part 2. A Demon Case Study Demon! Not my most coherent of phone greetings, but this was Aunt Griselda. She'd understand. Your place or mine? Mine. I bounced on my toes in excitement. We decided in advance to meet at whoever's home was closest to the creature's location. I'm fetching my cane as we speak. You're okay to transport me to your house? Magical transport when stressed? No problem, but only because I'd been practicing. Ever since we'd hatched our plan, I'd been like a husband with a pregnant wife about to pop with their first, waiting for the big day and going through the routine over and over again. Tagging a person for transport was a bit beyond my skill. I was no witchy transport expert. Instead, I'd tagged Aunt Griselda's cane. She barely used it anymore, but it wasn't a bad prop to have handy when confronting unpredictable creatures, and much, much easier to tag for transport than a live person. Absolutely, I said with barely contained excitement. Just say when, and be careful. My great aunt had a knee replacement six months ago. She was doing really well, keeping up with her exercises, spending a little time on her stationary bike, and walking every day. 
She was a beast when it came to her workouts. She wasn't about to rely on magic to get her through rehab. She knew the effort she put in would come back threefold. But that didn't mean she couldn't hurt herself if she was flustered or in a hurry. Go, 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 go! She chanted into the phone only seconds later, as if this was some military op. I grinned, then yanked her across several miles of traffic-filled Austin to my house. Oof! She grunted as she arrived. My landings weren't the best, and her house was at the outer limit of my transport reach. I steadied her with a hand on her elbow. When she tapped her cane on the ground and grinned, I said, Ready? Are you kidding? I'm more than ready. What an adventure! Except our adventure was destined for delay. Our demon had gone walkabout. Using my creature radar, we tracked it to a local cemetery. A witch, fiddling with prohibited spirit communication, had likely allowed it to slip through. But it hadn't lingered amongst the gravestones. From the graveyard, we followed it to a tea shop. As I pulled into the parking lot, Aunt Griselda pursed her lips. You're sure? A tea shop? Maybe you need to calibrate your antennae. There was no calibrating. When a new creature came into my area, my internal radar pinged. I got this funny feeling, higher than my stomach but lower than my heart. Took me ages to figure out I didn't have chronic indigestion, and even longer to recognize the nuanced differences between the types of creatures that pinged on my magical radar. Thus far, I'd only been able to pinpoint about half a dozen varieties, since I had to track them down and then identify them using all things magical and bumpy things in the night, my great aunt's compendium of magic creatures and items, I figured a handful of IDs in a few months' time wasn't so bad. As for calibrating my antennae, it just didn't work that way. The closer I got to the creature, the stronger the feeling, until I had a sort of aha moment and just knew that he, she, or it was within spitting distance. Okay, slight exaggeration. Even Cousin Seth, the loony family spitting champion, was only good for a solid eight feet. I'd say my aha happened within 20 or 30 feet. And here is a funny quirk. I wasn't a walking who's who of creatures in the greater Austin area. After a while, they simply faded off my radar. Initially, I thought it was a question of range, that creatures I no longer sensed had left the vicinity. But through trial and error, and repeated sightings of a particularly mischievous furry fairy in my neighbor's yard, I realized that wasn't true. I suspected my magic treated these lingering creatures much like a bad smell, and that I'd become the magical version of nose-blind to them. Sensory adaptation was the more technical term. It probably kept me from being overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of creatures that I'd otherwise have pinging on my radar. I didn't take offense at my great aunt's skepticism, giving my own slow acceptance of the facts. It had taken six months of supposed gastric issues before I recognized that magic was afoot. My discovery had taken so long that I'd come to believe that the chalky taste of chewable antacids was simply a fact of life. Odd how discovering the cause of the sensations changed their effect on my body. What had been a cause of discomfort was now simply information, neither pleasant nor uncomfortable. No calibration necessary, promise. I've tested my antennae several times. I grinned at her. But... I've never approached any of them. Thank you for agreeing to do this with me. Having a partner in crime made all the difference. When I'd contemplated approaching one of my creatures before, I'd always felt silly or a little scared. With Aunt Griselda by my side, I felt adventurous and also filled with purpose. We were updating the entries in her guide, Magical and Bumpy, I was thrilled to be part of creating the second edition, and even more so that we were using my newly discovered oddball magic.
All right, then. If you say the demon's in the tea shop, then we're having tea. I loved that she was so supportive, even when I'd originally told her of my eccentric aptitude for finding creatures. She simply replied, How absolutely exciting! No judgment. I hadn't told the rest of the family, because their support was likely to be tempered with concern, pity, and a good dose of skepticism. Aunt Griselda offered unconditional encouragement. Before I got out of the car, I told her, They also have coffee and a really good all-day breakfast menu. Like me, Aunt Griselda was always game for a good breakfast. Even at, I checked the digital clock on my dash, three o'clock in the afternoon. Ooh, her eyes lit up. Will you order bacon? And if they have biscuits and gravy? You got it. It was a deal we made long ago, when she'd first gotten the news her cholesterol was on the rise. Not dangerously so, but enough to warrant an overhaul to her diet. We'd agreed that I'd order all the things she couldn't have, and she'd get a taste. In return, she'd refrain from eating those items in all their large proportioned glory. Three o'clock on a Thursday in a location known to provide caffeine, comfortable seating, and internet access yielded a tea shop full of laptops. All it took was a quick scan to reveal a single patron who was enjoying his tea, a full pot, without the distraction of a screen. Dark hair, clean-shaven, neatly dressed, and tall, with a muscular build. That was our guy. His shoulders were nearly as wide as the armchair he'd chosen, and his knees knocked up against the coffee table where his meal had been laid out. And yet, he appeared completely at ease. With a head tilt and slight frown, Aunt Griselda whispered, Him? I nodded, but shared her skepticism. He was really, really attractive. As in, I wasn't normally one to make the first move, but I might consider it in his case, if he weren't a demon. But he was a demon, and we were here to learn more about his kind. This wasn't at all the scenario my great aunt and I had envisioned. We'd pictured some light stalking, lots of note-taking, and maybe, if we were lucky, a brief interaction that we'd as yet left undefined. I think we should just walk right up to him. Obviously, he can communicate. He ordered tea. She leaned forward with a squint. And scones. Those look delicious. Yep, I'll add them to my order. She patted my arm. You're my favorite niece. I swallowed a grin. I knew who her favorite was. Spoiler, not me. But that was just fine. I loved Aunt Griselda like crazy, and I was sure the feeling was mutual. Our demon didn't seem to be going anywhere. Half his plate was still filled with food. He'd gone for scones, a side of bacon, a poached egg, and toast. So there was plenty there to keep him busy. And he hadn't seemed to have noticed our presence. Our weirdly lingering at the front door presence. Good thing this tea shop was more like a coffee shop than a cafe and had counter service. A hostess would have been inconvenient. Approach first and order later? I asked. Smart. That way, if we have to make a run for it, we're not wasting any food. Ever practical, my great aunt. My reasoning had been that we didn't want to miss him if he happened to finish his meal and hoof it before we paid. Arm in arm, we approached the big bad demon, who was in fact big, but looked like Harry Cavill in Superman. So how bad could he be? He eyed us, first with wariness and then curiosity. You're not him. Oh, sorry. Were you expecting someone? I wasn't sure if I was sad that we hadn't met his expectation, shocked that his English, American accent and all, was perfect, or dismayed that he'd been expecting a guest. Avoiding someone. 
He smiled. The demon smiled. At us. And not a single fang in sight. Maybe the part about them sucking the blood of witches and wizards was one of the incorrect tidbits nestled within my great aunt's entry on demons. He gestured to the sofa situated across the coffee table from his own seat. Would you care to join me? Aunt Griselda and I shared a glance. I read on her face exactly what I was feeling. Yes. So many yeses. A face-to-face sit-down interview so far exceeded our expectations that it hadn't even popped up as a possibility during our planning. I'm sure we looked wide-eyed and eager as we seated ourselves, but this much excitement was hard to hide. We were talking to a demon. Having tea with a demon. Or we were about to, because even though this establishment didn't have table service, the young woman behind the counter had arrived to take our order. Glancing from the friendly waitress to our demon companion, Aunt Griselda said, Do you mind? I could use a nibble. Not at all. My treat. He couldn't pay for us. We were about to interrogate him. And I was going to order a lot of food. Oh, no, I'm rather hungry, and I insist. Then he smiled at the patient waitress. On my bill, please, Steph. Who knew demons were so polite? To protest further would have been rude, so we accepted and ordered. Me, coffee, and enough food for an army, so that Aunt Griselda could get her rich foods fix by nibbling from my plate. And Aunt Griselda, a very modest dry toast and black tea. How exactly did a demon pay for his meals? Maybe, if he didn't dine and dash, I'd find out. You were looking for me? Our demon asked with a polite smile. This isn't at all how I expected this outing to go, for a variety of reasons, and I certainly hadn't expected I'd have to fess up to my stalking behavior. I cleared my throat. Yes, well, not you exactly. We don't know you, so we couldn't really be looking for you. But people like you, yes. Aunt Griselda smiled broadly, as if this explained everything. Our demon looked first at my great aunt and then at me. Maybe we'd stumped him. A slight frown marred his forehead, a result of confusion more than displeasure, I hoped. An understandable reaction. I found my magic confusing as well, and a little embarrassing. I'd never heard of my sort of magic before. An affinity for creature finding? It was like coming from a family of math geniuses and inheriting the ability to make really amazing peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. There was nothing inherently wrong with an amazing sandwich-making skill, but exactly how useful was it? Especially when compared to the math geniuses, or potion masters, littering my family tree. Then there was the stigma. Having unusual magic wasn't done. It didn't happen. Or if it did, it was quietly swept under the carpet or locked in a closet for no one to see. And sandwich making, oh, creature finding, was a thoroughly bizarre and, so far as I knew, unique variety of magic. Finally, after a lengthy silence, our demon said, You're looking for people like me. His eyes an icy blue that I couldn't miss, now that he was staring so intently at me, held a terrifying intelligence. I felt seen, in a way I wasn't accustomed to, weighed. But funnily enough, not judged. Even so, it was disconcerting. I wasn't used to people looking beyond the shiny surface. Men hit on me, they asked me out on dates, they flirted, They didn't actually see me. I blinked, breaking what seemed like a standoff. Maybe this had been a mistake, being so direct. The tension that had seeped into his shoulders when we'd admitted we were looking for people like him eased. Whatever he'd observed while peering into the depths of my soul, or so it had felt, had reassured him. With a lopsided quirk of his lips, he said, 
You know what I am? I glanced around the room. No one was close enough to hear us, but I lowered my voice anyway. A demon. And you were looking for a demon? Any demon? Aunt Griselda seemed fascinated by our exchange. Probably something to do with that soul-searching stare he'd given me. Her head swiveled back and forth between us. Then she said, No, today we are looking for a demon, because there was a demon to find. On another day, we might be looking for... Uh, she turned to me. A dragon, I supplied. They're not nearly so large as you think, and like to roost in the lower branches of trees. Our demon's lips quirked with amusement. I'm aware. Oh, I nodded. I wasn't so sure that most witches or wizards knew so much. Dragons had a sort of magical camouflage that allowed them to blend in with the local fauna, a camouflage that most of the magical community hadn't discovered. Magical and Bumpy certainly didn't contain that information. To say the entry on dragons was thin would be kind. But no dragons today, he clarified. Today, you were looking for a demon. When my great aunt and I nodded, he said, with what seemed to be complete sincerity, Now that you've found me, how can I help you? Aunt Griselda gave the remaining food on his plate a pointed look. First, you can finish your meal before it goes cold. He smiled again. It made little wrinkles appear at the corner of his eyes and made him ten times more attractive. Thank you. I think I might. Then he extended his hand, first to my great aunt and then to me. You can call me Sylvester. Interesting. Not my name is Sylvester. I'm Griselda, and this is my niece, Beatrice. Trixie, I corrected. All of my friends call me Trixie. Not that I loved the nickname, but it was better than the alternative. Eyes wide and voice eager, Aunt Griselda said, We're so thrilled to be sharing a meal with you. Always better to share a meal than to be the meal. She didn't just say that. She didn't. Please let the floor open and swallow me. But she did say it. And Sylvester's response? He laughed. It was a genuine sound, originating in his chest and traveling through his body with a joyful ease. I like you, Griselda. Her eyes twinkled as she replied. I'm reserving judgment, but I very much want to like you, Sylvester. Our food arrived, saving us from delving into the deep end with questions like, Is it true that demons feast on the blood of witches? Not the best beginning if we wanted to encourage Sylvester's cooperation. I asked the server if we might have an extra plate, and when it was delivered, carefully placed small portions of bacon, blueberry scone, biscuits and gravy, and cheesy grits on it. Sylvester watched this without comment, but Aunt Griselda felt compelled to explain our odd ritual. It's my cholesterol. It's creeping up. And you probably know magic doesn't touch such things. I've had to alter my diet in a way that I find bordering on tragic. He pressed his lips together, probably trying not to laugh at our silliness. I know I'm supporting her bad food habit, I shrugged. Aunt Griselda patted my arm. Shush now. It's our little deal that has me sticking to my diet on all the other days, dear. Then she explained our bargain to Sylvester, who demonstrated impeccable manners and refrained from laughing. His warm gaze met mine. An admirable solution. And, Griselda, how are your cholesterol numbers? Her eyebrows climbed. Not you, too. But fine, thank you. Just fine. Sylvester set his napkin aside and spent the next few minutes watching us eat. He didn't appear to be in any hurry, 
and I had to wonder, why here? Why this tea shop? The food was excellent, but he'd slipped into our world from another, sneaked through an illegal gateway created by a foolishly incautious witch, not an everyday occurrence, and landed here. Maybe I'd ask him. I'd have to see how the conversation went. The waitress, Steph, came by and cleared the dishes away. We were getting much better service than the screen-addicted crowd. When Steph left us, Sylvester repeated his question from before. Now, how can I help you? Best to just jump in. So I said, We're writing a guide, actually updating one that has some outdated information. He raised his eyebrows. On demons? He smiled politely, and that was when I realized he'd never directly confirmed that he was in fact a demon. He'd merely failed to challenge our assumption. Aunt Griselda assumed an apologetic expression, as if a single entry in an encyclopedia book were an insult. Not just demons. It's a resource book for witches. All things magical and bumpy things in the night. That's the name of the book. There are articles on a variety of topics, but mostly, uh, can I say creatures? Is that offensive? He tipped his head thoughtfully. If demons are keeping company with dragons among the pages of your book, I can see how creatures might be a good catch-all. I leaned forward as I waited for him to say yay or nay. This project was important to me. Not only was it a way to explore my own newly discovered magical ability, a way that gave my strange talent value, it was also a benefit to the witch community. Once again, I was subjected to the intense scrutiny of a man who might just like to drink my blood. And once again, I wasn't frightened, not in any physical sense. He nodded once, as if satisfied. I'll help you, but I have a few conditions. First, demons should absolutely be categorized as bumpy things in the night. Then he grinned. Aunt Griselda grinned right back at him. Deal! What else have you got? I asked, because it couldn't be this easy. You can ask whatever you like, and I'll be as truthful as possible. But... He met my gaze, and it felt like he was peering into the furthest nooks and crannies of my soul. You can only publish what I approve. I was about to agree, because yes, all the yeses, limited correct information was hands down better than the possibility of disseminating incorrect information. But before I could do more than nod, he added, And I'll need your blood. Me. He was looking at me. I must have looked appalled, because his eyes lit with humor. A small amount, not intended for any nefarious purposes. Maybe I looked like a woman about to be pounced upon, because he uttered the last part with a self-deprecating smile. Time to take courage in my hands and skip the preliminaries. I really had planned to ease my way into the topic, but I swallowed. Since you've mentioned it, do demons consume witch blood? No answers until you agree. You'll only publish what I approve? He waited. Yes, I replied, because that was entirely fair. And Griselda agreed as well when Sylvester turned to her for a response. And your blood. Why? I asked, followed by Aunt Griselda's. Why her? Why? He said, choosing to focus on my question. Call it a token of trust. I'm trusting you with sensitive information. Asking for a small demonstration of your own trust is only equitable. My great aunt's question remained unanswered. I shared a look with her. Your decision, she said, which was a punt, but a fair one. If she had any reservations, she'd voice them. The risk was mine, and therefore 
the decision had to be my own. With neither my great aunt's intuition nor my own warning against it, I considered his proposition. Blood for knowledge. Was it worth the gamble? Sylvester was right. What better way to establish trust? I didn't know what could be done with my blood. We were here to learn more about demons, after all, so their ability to do magic with blood or bind with blood or... There was no point in enumerating the risks. Our ignorance made them abundant, and my imagination was no guide or limit to the possibilities. Nothing nefarious or harmful to me? I asked. Nothing nefarious or harmful to you, he repeated with conviction. And you'll answer all of our questions? He nodded slowly. I'll answer every question that I can safely answer. I narrowed my eyes. What sort of qualifier was that? That he could safely answer? But again, it came down to trust. And how much I longed for the knowledge he held. How do we do this? In a public place with a dozen or more witnesses. He held out his hand, palm up. I teetered on the edge of uncertainty for a heartbeat, then two. But truly, I'd already made the decision. I placed my hand in his. He turned it over and kissed my palm. It was only when he'd withdrawn that I realized there was a small nick in the skin, a tiny wound inflicted without any pain. He leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms. His mouth worked as if savoring a small sip of wine. He paused, then smiled slightly. All right, I'll answer your questions now, though he looked at me. A word of advice. Don't share your blood willingly with any, uh, creatures in the future. They may be less benevolent. I quelled the urge to protest his advice. His words were sincere, if irritating under the circumstances. Perhaps it had been a mistake to give him the taste he'd had. But I didn't think so. Fangs? Aunt Griselda said, before I could further contemplate the wisdom of my choice. You must have them, but I haven't seen them. How does that work? Sylvester smiled broadly, then dropped Fang. I didn't know how else to describe it. Two pointy teeth descended, clearly on his command. Aunt Griselda's eyes widened, then she surreptitiously scanned the tea shop. Not a soul gave us even a passing glance. The patrons of the shop were enthralled by the contents of their phones, tablets, and laptops. Thank you, she murmured, eyes still wide and bright with curiosity. You do eat witch blood. He just consumed mine, so it seemed a safe assumption. First, a little background. Not to be published. When Aunt Griselda and I nodded our eager agreement, he said, Magic comes from beyond the veil. I believe that's the witch name for my home. Yes, that's right. Aunt Griselda's head bobbed up and down enthusiastically. She was having a blast. Magic? All magic? This demon purported to possess more knowledge than the entirety of our magical community. The origin of magic? That was like discussing the meaning of life. All had an opinion, none the answer. He refilled his teacup from the pot on the table. All magic I've encountered here in this world originates from mine, yes. And you know this how? I asked. He seemed sincere, but that could have simply been proof of a delusional state. His statement was sweeping in nature and presumed a depth of knowledge I found suspect. Because my world is magic and yours is not. The magic in this world stands apart, like a visitor in a foreign land, but possessing an accent that is very familiar to me. Fascinating, 
Aunt Griselda sighed, eyeing Sylvester like a large slice of pumpkin pie. I would so love to take notes, but I know that that's not part of the deal. She hurried to reassure him. Aunt Griselda didn't appear plagued by the same doubts as me. There are cracks, sometimes gateways, between this world and my own. Some of my people slip through intentionally and are frequent visitors like myself. Others accidentally fall through. And some are pulled here. I appreciated the background information, of course, and I also understood why none of it could appear in our book. This information, if it was accurate, changed so much about what we knew of magic and would create a flood of experimenters. Witches and wizards eager for more power, intent on exploring another world, or enchanted by the thought of meeting those other magical people. Other magical people. Sylvester called them his people, not demons. You're not a demon. I shook my head. What I mean to say, that's not how you prefer to be called? With a wry expression, he replied, I don't find it offensive. Amusing, perhaps. It's not a word we use for ourselves. At my questioning look, he said, Daimon is the word's origin, I believe, which is closer to our native word. But use whichever word you like. Sorry, you were saying about how your people come to be here in different ways. I didn't realize I'd changed my terminology until I saw him smile. Travelers, people like me. He placed the slightest emphasis on people, which let me know that he'd noted and appreciated the change. We come and go, not exactly at will, but with no great difficulty. Those who fall into this place or are pulled here are usually younger, less experienced, and ill-prepared. I could begin to see how this might tie in to consuming blood, my original question. Those people have a very different experience in your world. They're vulnerable, at risk of possession, and also driven by unfamiliar hungers. And there it was. Bloodlust, I said. He tipped his head, considering my word choice. No, I think it's more a case of exposure to something so tempting that it's almost impossible to say no. Aunt Griselda and I sneaked a glance at each other, which elicited a chuckle from Sylvester. You're perfectly safe. I'm no 21-year-old in a bar for the first time. Oh, yes, I see, Aunt Griselda smiled. We're an indulgence, not a dietary requirement. I sat on this too soft sofa and wondered at the direction of my life. I had a job in IT a few days ago. Now I was basically unemployed and discussing the nutritional value of witch's blood with a demon over tea. Actually, I was drinking coffee. Tea didn't do it for me, not even mid-afternoon. Not while having a chat with a demon I'd just given a taste of my blood. Except he wasn't a demon. A daimon? Or a traveler? A person from another world? An alien? Maybe a foreigner? No, a traveler. He named himself such, so I would try to do the same. Hun, Aunt Grisilda laid a hand on my arm. Sylvester was just explaining about possession, which is a sort of mind control, and not possession as we understand it at all. I'm sorry, I was just... I stopped, realizing I had no explanation. Sorry, possession? And this was how I learned in greater detail about witches and wizards hijacking daimons who arrived in this world without sufficient protection. An illegal practice I'd heard of, but never knew very much about. Aunt Griselda and I also learned that a daimon's physical body couldn't travel through the gateway between our worlds. With a quick perusal of Sylvester's rather nice earthly body, 
I couldn't help but ask. Is this body not, um, yours? His ice-blue eyes narrowed. It's not borrowed, if that's what you mean. The body we assume here is a mirror image of the one we inhabit in our own world. He leaned forward slightly. Not something I'd appreciate reading in your book. Because of the mention of the other side, your home. I nodded that I understood. He'd already been clear on that point. So our similar appearances have to make it easier to, you know... Partake of local refreshment? He offered with raised brow, but there was a glint of humor in those icy eyes that warmed them. Aunt Griselda snorted. I was going to say, blend in. His gaze met mine again. I didn't have the same feeling he was peering straight into my soul this time, but it was still oddly intense. Again, I felt seen. Maybe his intense looks were attributable to nothing more than his unusual eye color, but I didn't think so. I was beginning to suspect magic, and even with that new knowledge, I didn't feel threatened. Just attracted. Wow. Was it warm in here, or what? A discreet jab to my ribs had me blushing even harder. If Aunt Griselda had noticed, then it was likely pretty darn obvious that I was making eyes at Sylvester. That name, it was almost as bad as Beatrice. Is Sylvester your real name? I wasn't sure what sort of answer I expected, but his reply wouldn't have made my top ten list. I have various identities set up for my visits to this world. It makes the practicalities, such as dining out or moving about the city, much simpler. He smiled, the easy, charming smile from our initial meeting. In Austin, I'm Sylvester. Fascinating, Aunt Griselda said. You're like a spy behind enemy lines, complete with secret identities and exceptional language skills. He laughed again, the sound deep and rolling. Thank goodness, because calling someone a spy isn't exactly a compliment. I consider myself more like a very old exchange student. I'm here to learn about and enjoy the culture. No underlying political motivations. Promise. He gave Aunt Griselda one of those intent looks. But unlike me, she didn't blush. Yes, I've always been a fan of cultural exchanges. True fact. My great aunt had hosted a few witches from other countries when she was younger. But not every daimon coming to our world shares your principled motivations, as you mentioned earlier. What of the visitors who are overcome by the walking, talking temptations surrounding them? I had been on the cusp of bringing this up myself. People as prey was a concept that I found problematic. Go figure. Only in very rare instances is a donor harmed. His non-answer failed to satisfy. Also, I wouldn't classify the victim of an attack as a donor. I've heard of deaths, bodies drained of blood. Aunt Griselda cocked her head. Any explanation for that? That wasn't in Magical and Bumpy. Perhaps a possessed visitor, or, he sighed, a murderer. We have our monsters, just as you do. Daimons who don't value life and take no care to preserve it. But like here, such people are the exception. Ninety-nine percent of daimon bites result in a minor loss of blood and no harm to the donor. Hmm. My great aunt leveled a critical look on him. Sylvester crossed his arms. Can you control every underage drinker with a fake ID? Not at all the same, I protested. Underage drinkers aren't attacking unsuspecting witches to score their cheap beer and shots. No, but my point that both are equally difficult to control is valid. 
there are protections in place. We minimize as best we can. Aunt Griselda considered his words. It really came down to trust. Just as he was revealing potentially sensitive information about his people and trusting us not to misuse it, we had to trust that what he shared was truthful and accurate. She finally nodded. All right, then. What do you think we should include in the updated edition of our book? He gave us the highlights on dealing with possessed daimons. Nothing that would do permanent, specifically deadly, harm to any of his people, but some tips and tricks for staying safe when confronted with a possible visitor, as well as some helpful ways of breaking the bond, holding the demon captive to a witch's or wizard's will. As for Daimon's snacking on witches, and also wizards and non-magical folk, fun fact that we learned. Daimon's release a narcotic when they bite. The deeper and longer the bite, the greater the effect. But other than knocking out the victim, it's otherwise harmless. In fact, it makes the Daimon's bite painless. Another fun fact? Daimon's manufactured their bodies when they arrived, so they could interact within the world. It wasn't automatic and required different amounts of time based on a variety of factors. Age of the visitor, how powerful her magic was, and whether they'd done it before or not. And this was how they ended up with a mirror image of their original bodies. Because that was the blueprint their magic followed to create the new one. So if your body isn't the one and only original version, I asked, while perhaps simultaneously admiring that body, then are you saying that harming your body doesn't harm you? Looking to harm my body, Trixie? There were things I might like to do, but they didn't involve any harm, that's for sure. I didn't bother answering his question. He was only teasing me. I suspected that in different circumstances, Sylvester would be an outrageous flirt. Fine. His eyes crinkled with amusement. It's created with magic and can be repaired with magic. Except for massive trauma. Decapitation! My great aunt's enthusiasm, in this instance, was a little unnerving. She grinned at me. Don't look so shocked. It's the way to kill most things with regenerative powers. True. Sylvester agreed casually, as if it was a matter of course that such things happened. Not in my world. We can't tell witches to go around decapitating people, even if it only kills a daimon's body and not the rest of him. My objection led to a discussion about whether or not to include decapitation in our revised entry on demons. We wouldn't be changing the name in the book, because then we'd have to explain why. Then we agreed to omit any reference to the mechanics of binding. I'm so sorry. I wasn't sure why I was apologizing. I haven't ever done such a thing and never would. Controlling others, turning them into puppets subject to another person's will. It made my scalp crawl. I guess I apologized because, as a witch, I felt responsible for witches the world over. Opening a gateway to your world is a forbidden act, but it obviously happens. Narrowing her eyes, Aunt Griselda asked, How did you come to be here? We suspected a local witch of opening a communication channel beyond the veil since you arrived in a cemetery. I frowned. Without a witch's illegal act, there would be no Sylvester sitting across from us in a tea shop. And that was an unpleasant thought. His eyes twinkled. That assumes I'm limited to travel facilitated by others. Oh, I just assumed you couldn't... Wow. I just thought that we, witches and wizards, whose magic apparently originated in Sylvester's world, were the only ones capable of creating doorways. And now I realize how foolish that assumption was. Sorry. Not at all. Even if one doesn't have the ability to open a door, there are cracks and crevices between the worlds that can be manipulated as well. 
Aunt Griselda tapped a fingernail on the coffee table and leaned forward. That's how magic got here, isn't it? Through these cracks and crevices. That's the prevalent theory, yes. I wanted to ask about the ghosts of people who'd passed. Were these cracks how they ended up in his world? Assuming they even landed there, maybe the gateway we opened in this world led to more than one place. But I knew that Sylvester either wouldn't or couldn't answer these questions. My intuition speaking, perhaps. And then the moment to ask passed, because Sylvester was sharing more information. These witches and wizards who are opening the gates, just so you know, they're the ones who are most easily able to ensnare inexperienced daimons. When we step through the gate, we're marked with the magic of the gate's creator, making it easier to find and then bind us. So you don't use those gates! I brightened as I realized that we didn't have a local rogue witch that's good news for us. It means there's no witch making illegal calls beyond the veil. Except you did come through the cemetery, right? He smiled softly, a curious tilt to his head. You're a refreshing change. He shook his head and blinked, and I realized he likely hadn't intended his words to be spoken aloud. Thanks? His charming grin flashed again. Yes, this man was a tremendous flirt when he wasn't being interrogated by nosy witches. I just knew he was. You're very welcome. If you've exhausted your questions, I have an appointment with my tailor shortly. A suit by any chance? Aunt Griselda asked, all innocent and wide-eyed. I managed not to roll my eyes, partially because it was rude, but also because I couldn't entirely argue with the direction of her predictable thoughts. Yes, I'm overdue. A dark navy, I think. Aunt Griselda sighed, the lustful sigh of a woman who loved a good-looking man in a well-tailored suit. I knew I'd like you. I believe you wanted very much to like me. Have I graduated? He teased her with the confidence of a man accustomed to being openly admired. He lifted his hand to signal for the check. Oh, yes, you've definitely graduated. Hasn't he, Trixie? I wasn't going to participate in their flirtation. Sylvester, or whatever his real name was, didn't live here. He wasn't even an out-of-towner here on business. He lived in a completely different world, literally. What was the point of flirtation with a man who was both impractical and unattainable? Thank you for all your help. I stopped when Steph the waitress arrived. She was exceptionally attentive for a place that didn't normally have table service. After Sylvester produced a stack of bills and told Steph to keep the change, I had an answer to my earlier question. It seemed daimones, or travelers at least, paid for their tea with cold, hard cash. Also, Steph told him it was nice to see him again, and our excellent service was explained. Sylvester, our otherworldly traveler, had been to the tea shop before, was quite possibly a regular. Turning his attention back to us, he said, It was no problem at all. I hope the information we've discussed is beneficial to all parties. And I enjoyed sharing a meal. His comment sparked my memory. Oh, I'd forgotten. You said that you were avoiding someone earlier. Maybe we can help you with that. I looked to my great aunt for confirmation. There was a small chance we'd be interfering in matters we shouldn't, but he'd been so very helpful that it seemed worth the small risk. Besides, my intuition was on board with the offer. I felt the urge to reciprocate his kindness. This entire encounter had exceeded our expectations by miles. Yes, she agreed. We'd be happy to, of course. His steady gaze met mine, and once again I felt seen. I was trying to avoid an encounter with a demon hunter, but I was confused. No demon hunter is searching for me. I blinked, breaking eye contact. 
Demon Hunter. That was new. Never heard of them. How should we contact you? Aunt Griselda asked, looking back and forth between the two of us. So you can approve the new entry to our book. Ah, my plans are always unpredictable, given the nature of my visits. But I'm sure your entry will be fine. I know you'll abide by the agreement we made. He glanced at my hand, the one he'd taken the small sip of blood from. Too bad. Again, she looked between the two of us. Her behavior was a little odd, unless... Was my great aunt matchmaking? With a demon, a traveler, who didn't even live in the same world as us. She must really have given up all romantic hope for me. Might we see you again? Aunt Griselda pulled a card from her purse. I'd designed it for her, so I knew exactly what it said. The front was her contact information, including a cell number. The back was the newly designed cover of Magical and Bumpy. He accepted it, then read it carefully, front and back. Perhaps. I enjoy this world and my visits here, but it does have its dangers. The demon hunter, I replied. He nodded. They're a tenacious bunch, and they're able to spot a traveler's appearance in this world from several miles distant. Their special tracking skill gives them a decided advantage in any chase. He smiled, shook our hands, and exited before the implication of his words evolved into a full-formed thought. Me. I'm able to spot a creature from miles away. I'm able to track creatures' movements. I'm a demon hunter? No. I rejected that conclusion, because I didn't hunt any creatures. Not demons, not travelers, not any other. I wasn't on the hunt. I didn't want to hurt anyone. I was an observer and a cataloger only. Certainly no demon hunter. I found it fascinating that Sylvester, who'd recognized my magic, had agreed that I wasn't a demon hunter at all. Fascinating and touching. He'd seen inside me, perhaps with the help of my blood, and he hadn't seen a hunter. As Aunt Griselda and I exited the tea shop, there was no sign of the mysterious man who was a demon, but yet wasn't. Maybe we'd see him again. Maybe not. My great aunt turned to me and wrapped me up in a hug full of warmth and love. I accepted the comfort she gave without hesitation. With a final squeeze and a deep sigh, she let go of me and walked around to the other side of the car. Once I was behind the wheel, I said, Not that I'm complaining, because you know I love your hugs. I do give the best hugs. I grinned as I started the car. You do. But why now? Your heart needed a hug. And that was all the explanation she'd give. For new audiobook release announcements from Kate Lolly and fun extras, join her audiobook newsletter list at katelolly.com slash free dash audiobook. This has been Tea with a Demon, a cursed candy story. Written by Kate Lawley, narrated by Jennifer March. Copyright 2020 by Catherine G. Cobb. Production copyright 2021 by Catherine G. Cobb.